Hello, and welcome back to another video series. This one is going to be a bit different from the past videos. As the title of the video suggests, I want to discuss how Bergson's thought has affected my interest in occultism. This will be a lot more personal and less formal than the previous guide videos on this channel, although I still plan to make those. This video will discuss the two main approaches to interpreting the occult, and how reading Bergson has influenced me to transform my approach. In the second video, we'll look at Bergson's idea of pure memory and the virtual, and explore the potential they have for occult thought in general. And finally, in chapter 3, we'll apply this to a more specific occult practice, that is, necromancy, or communication with the dead, while also discussing the genesis of individual subjectivity. I've been thinking about Bergson's philosophy in relation to occult topics for a while now, and it's been an abundant source of thought for me. That being said, I'm still working my ideas out. Making this video will most definitely push me my thought forward, but in that it is preliminary, some of these ideas are in their early stage of development. Echoing a Bergsonian pursuit, this video will be much about finding and formulating the right questions questions that open the possibility for new thought, and less about providing rigid answers. I want to thank everyone who has engaged with the previous videos, and has shown me that they are of value. This has been a great source of inspiration for me, and has encouraged me to push this further, and to do so out in the open. I realize that this topic is somewhat arcane in its specificity, but if you find this at all interesting, ridiculous, or a downright misreading, I would love to hear your thoughts. To work out ideas in public is a form of collaboration, and I'm grateful that this opportunity to do so is so readily available. In this series, I will try my best to stay as close to Bergson's ideas as possible, mainly working with his masterpiece Matter and Memory, but also referencing some material in Time and Free Will. But in that the nature of this kind of project and interpretation itself is creative, the concepts will evolve and transform as they are approached in relation to the occult. Much like my other videos, I will strive to make the content accessible, assuming as little prior knowledge as possible. Now you might be wondering what I'm talking about here, as Bergson rarely, if ever, explicitly mentions the occult, at least in the works I've read. And inversely, if you are familiar with occult thought, a field that is not shy to reference philosophers, you may go many books without ever encountering his name. So if this is the case, why am I making this video? At the most fundamental level, it is because my reading of Bergson and taking his ideas seriously unexpectedly shifted my perspective on occult topics in turn opening and in a sense deepening my understanding of Bergson through this cyclical process of mutual contamination and recombination. This is the type of cross-disciplinary influence I believe is most fruitful. Not one where we seek to reduce one system to another through analogy, but one where we explore the transformative potential in thinking across fields. So to start, I will give a personal account of my transformation before we get into the more rigorous and technical analysis of how Bergson's philosophy combines with occult thought and practice, and also extending to how his ideas are useful to occult thinkers and practitioners. For a long time I've been interested in the occult, specifically areas such as folk magic, ritual magic, spirit conjuration, demonology, communication with the dead, alchemy, and psi phenomena in general. I find reading about these topics incredibly fascinating and extremely thought-provoking. Yet, I've recently found that my interest in these topics has shifted from a perspective that firmly sees them as aspects of the human psyche to one that is open to their ontological reality, that is, existence outside of the mind. Much of this has arisen from my reading of Bergson, and how his philosophy has opened my understanding of mind to one that is radically temporal. 
Let me trace out this transformation, which starts with the psychologist Carl Jung. When I was 18, my dad gave me a Carl Jung book. I think it was Modern Man in Search of a Soul. This had a profound effect on me. It opened my thoughts to parts of myself I didn't even know existed. I was thoroughly obsessed with Jung for many years. Part of Jung's allure was that he did not back down from the occult. He took things like myths, spiritual entities, gods, and omens seriously, in a field that saw these as superstitions to move beyond. On first reading, it seems that Jung's interest in the occult was that these phenomena were symbolically significant and ripe territory for understanding the structure of the human psyche. Although upon closer reading, and after his personal journals were released to the public, it becomes apparent that he was not closed to the idea that these phenomena could exist beyond the human psyche. Despite Jung's subtle openness, we find that the dominant Jungian approach to the occult is one that sees spiritual entities like demons as components of the human mind, as complexes projected as external experience. I find this is a prevalent interpretation, even within occult communities. For example, Aleister Crowley, one of the most prominent occultists of the 20th century, writes in the intro to his translation of The Lesser Key of Solomon that the spirits of The Lesser Key of Solomon are portions of the human brain. This symbolic or psychological position was more or less where I stood in relation to occult topics. But as I read Bergson, and this didn't happen in a split moment, but is an ongoing process, I found that taking his temporal metaphysics seriously, learning subtle and nuanced approach to multiplicity, conceiving a pure time not translatable to space, and working the motions of intuitive thinking, led me to a position where I could no longer be certain of my previous psychological stance. Bergson's starting point is to embed us in the world, to touch the real. He does not confine perception, the fundamental aspect of our experience, to our brain or mind, but gives us an account of the image as external, autonomous. I covered this in depth in my previous video on Bergson and images. This motion towards a view of the world that at its core allows for true external contact, true alterity is a motion that broadens past the fundamental aspect of perception and shows us a way that breaks outside of the individual in a real engagement with the whole of reality. This philosophy has opened the possibility for me and in some ways necessitated me to formulate the content of occult thought and my own mystical experience as autonomous and not merely a component of my own existence. Almost seamlessly, my study of Bergson transitioned me from a symbolically reductive Jungian model to one that allows for ontological autonomy. Now, that might have sounded like a lot or was somewhat confusing. Just stick with me, as I hope this will become more clear as I develop more specific instances in the rest of the video. So we have two main approaches to the occult. One that interprets the phenomena as symbolic projections of the human psyche, and one that sees the phenomena as existing autonomously. At first glance, there seems to be an irreconcilable gap between these two beliefs. Yet the psychological model varies radically depending on one's conception of mind or psyche. One of my favorite figures on occult topics is the podcaster, writer, and permaculturist Gordon White. He often references a quote that goes, it's all in your head, you just have no idea how big your head is. This is a great example of how the psychological interpretation of the occult has as much to do with one's conception of mind as it does the occult phenomena. In my reading of renegade post Jungian James Hillman, we can see a bold approach to mind that pushes the size and depth of psyche to a great extent. Rather than confining gods, myths, and even thoughts to the individual psyche, he suggests that the I, or ego, is constituted by these archetypes. 
If individual egos do not create these mythic narratives, but rather emerge from them, meaning, narrative, and archetypes must be attributed to the world. It's just that the world that is psyche is vast and contains forces that are not us. So in this redefining of psyche or mind, it becomes clear that when the psychological approach to the occult is pushed far enough, it can arrive at a place quite similar to the non-psychological approach that sees these beings and forces as ontologically real. Maybe an objection that might arise is that while both the approaches can arrive at a form of autonomy, they differ on the subjective status of these forces. Do the gods and archetypal characters that compose us have a subjective experience in Hillman's model? Although many Jungians and post-Jungians might argue against this idea, I don't think the answer is so clear, for we must remember that we as a human race have yet to fully understand what consciousness and subjectivity are. If meaning originates in the world and constitutes our egos, why should feeling and experience be confined to the embodied organism? Do thoughts themselves have a form of subjectivity? Are feelings and sensations a form of awareness in themselves? These are all interesting questions to me, but the point is that they open us up to the possibility that these two approaches can arrive in similar territory. If this is the case, why should it matter what approach we take? In many ways, our bias towards valuing answers over questions might move us to reduce these approaches to one another. But is philosophy and thought in general really about arriving at a static position? Is it a project of uncovering fixed truth in the world? If we assume these directions, we have already brought much to the table. We have already made assumptions about the nature of truth and function of thought. And even if we push these two systems of thought to a similar area as I just previously did, does our thought stop? Mine certainly doesn't. It continues to move, continues to ask questions and formulate concepts. By subordinating questions to answers, or seeing them as mere means to answers, we drastically restrict our potential of thought. We start ahead of ourselves missing out on the rich and rigorous project of generating questions and creating concepts. Deleuze, one of my favorite philosophers, reframes the entire project of philosophy as the creation of concepts. He proposes that concepts are neither truth nor fiction, but rather tools for thought that can be deeply rigorous, an observation demonstrated in his own work to an astonishing degree. Should one think about occult phenomena solely to arrive at a static conclusion? Are static conclusions really even possible or desirable? The point is, if we alleviate ourselves from having to think about the occult from a hierarchical orientation that points towards an ultimate and singular end, we enter into a wider realm of thought, one that allows for new possibilities and one in which thinking matters all the way through. So it is in this sense that I want to explore how Bergson's thought has been of a great value to me in relation to the occult. My hope is that others might find Bergson useful in the pursuit of occult philosophy and magical practice. In the next video, we explore a Bergsonian approach and discuss Bergson's philosophy more specifically to see what it opens for us in relation to the occult. This next video and the third, which talks about Bergson in relation to necromancy, should be out shortly, so stay tuned for that.